Without further ado, I can give you Pete Makalak. Thank you, Linnea. Welcome, everybody. Um, we have all experienced moments in our professional lives and our personal lives where it's really important to us to find, say the right thing, deliver those words in a meaningful way to produce the particular results we're after, whether we're talking to an individual person or a room full of people. And I think we've all experienced times when those moments uh, don't land as well as we want them to. We don't do as well as we want. The words don't come or what does come out lands in a way different from what we're after. The way that people are responding to us aren't what we intended and we're recognizing some kind of, some kind of shortcoming in our communication skills. Um, I think we all also know that employers, our bosses, the people that hired us, really value communication skills. There have been survey after survey after survey with American employers. Communication skills is always very high on the list in terms of what employers look for when they hire. And I'm sure if you've done the research about what possible uh, communication skills are out there that you could beef up, you've probably come across a billion possibilities, which can be kind of overwhelming because we can't wrap our brains around a billion possibilities. We, we have to whittle the list down to something workable. So this webinar is all about whittling it down to a handful of what I'm going to say are the most important, the most critical communication skills so that you can use them anywhere. And you can kind of mix, mix and match them in, in the various communication zones that are going to be important to you wherever you are in your career, wherever you work in your organization. So let's start here. Let's start with those five critical communication. Um, there's speaking upwards, which means your interactions and your presentations, not only with your boss, but with your boss's peers, with your boss's bosses, anywhere up the ladder. There's speaking to peers, speaking horizontally, the, the people who are on the same level with you, the, the folks that you're interacting with on a regular basis, but who aren't necessarily on your team. Maybe they are on your team, or they are um, parallel to you in other teams. There's speaking to the people who report to you. So this is for the leaders out there who know that their daily conversations and their daily presentations to the people who re report to them are going to say a lot about how that team does from day to day. Then there is speaking to customers. So whether or not you directly interact with customers of your organization, that's going to be relevant. Um, some people define customers in terms of the people that your team directly helps who are outside of your team, but still inside of the organization. When I say customers, I mean either of those two. And then there's speaking to prospects. So these are people out there who kind of fit the bill in terms of what your organization or what your team is after in terms of uh, wanting to work with customers, but they aren't customers yet. They fit the profile, but they haven't officially become customers yet. So these are the five zones. Let's take a closer look specifically at speaking upwards and specifically your boss. So. What does your boss want from you when you are interacting with him or her um, on a daily basis? Your boss wants you to be able to listen well. Your boss wants you to understand what's expected of you, and your boss wants you to accept instruction and guidance. 
your boss wants you to under the, understand the context of that instruction and guidance, and your boss wants you to be able to report about your results and your progress on a regular basis. So presentation, either one-on-one, -on -one -on -one, just in conversation with your boss, or more formally to the whole team is going to be part of the mix. Your boss is going to want you to be able to uh, present to him about a, a variety of things, not just these progress reports. Your boss is going, to be, uh, is going to want you to be able to ask really good questions so that you can gain the insight that you need to be able to do your job more effectively. Your boss is going to want you to be able to focus on the highest priorities. And your boss may not necessarily be all that attuned around what your highest priorities should be. Bosses very often just throw out a tremendous amount of things for you to have on your radar. And it's going to be up to you to prioritize them and to be able to communicate them in, a, in kind of a hierarchical way. Now, your peers. How does your organization want you to be able to communicate with your peers? They're going to want you to be flexible because in a company uh, scenario, there are going to be any number of personality types around you. They are going to want you to be able to talk with any of those personality types, to be able to receive them appropriately, respond to them appropriately, and produce results with them, no matter who they are. They're going to want you to be uh, responsive to um, what people bring to you. They're going to want you to be enjoyable. They're looking for you to make a positive ripple in the team that you're participating in. They're going to want you to be supportive. So it's really easy to come across non-supportive, even if you're just not, um, not speaking in any um, negative way. But if you're just neutral, that's not supportive. They're looking for you to listen to your peers, to really hear and really understand them, and to interpret them, not just to absorb the words that they're saying, but to understand more deeply what those words mean. They're looking for you to be able to think on your feet, because very often communications occur on a, on, on a very rapid, uh, in a very rapid way. They're going to want you to be able to think on your feet, respond in the moment, and communicate to your peers in a way that is useful and meaningful on a time frame that they need you to communicate in. They're going to want you to be able to influence without authority, because when you have things that you want your peers to do, and you don't have the authority to just tell them to do those, those things, they're going to want you to be able to communicate about those things in an effective way so that your peers understand what you're asking, and they understand the argument for why they should do it. They're also going to want you to be positive. If you're positive, then you are a contributional member of your team, kind of regardless of the scenario, no matter how difficult circumstances may be. So that's what your workspace is asking of you in terms of interacting with your peers. Now let's look at your team, the folks that report to you. What does your organization want from you as you lead these folks? They want you to be able to listen with understanding because your teammates, uh, uh, your, excuse me, your team members are going to come to you with questions, problems, difficulties, challenges, complaints, and they're going to want you to be able to handle this stuff. They're going to want you to be nurturing, to, to build these team members up to, so that they can become leaders of the future. They want you to be engaging and not just hold yourself up in your office and lead from a distance. They want you to interact with your team members directly. They want you to be able to present with inspiration because your team members need to be inspired. They want you to speak with authenticity. Nobody's going to ask you to, uh, to talk about something that you don't believe in. Or if they do, they're, they're going to want you to believe it before you say it. And if you have difficulty with that, you're going to need to get to a place where you do believe the words so that your team can trust you 
absolutely critical to the organization that your team trusts you to say what you believe and to believe what you say. Your organization wants you to influence. As a leader, you've got to be able to influence the members of your team. They want you to be charismatic, which can be a very soft, squishy thing, but with charisma comes followership. With charisma comes team members that want to listen to you and want to follow you. They want you to be persuasive, which is related to influence, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a sister concept that can come possibly without authority, possibly with, with uh, uh, um, organization members who are outside of your immediate team. They want you to be able to design compelling messages so that the people that you're talking to understand what the argument is, understand the why of what you're talking about. And they want you to be able to uh, project leadership presence so that when you walk into the, into the room, your folks recognize you for the leadership that you are, uh, that for the leader that you are, and they recognize that this is an important moment, maybe more important than the moment before you walked in. Now let's consider customers. So again, your customers are the people that your team serves, whether they are in your organization or external to your organization. Your, your organization is going to want you to be able to sell in some way to your customers. If you're interacting with them, they're going to want you to be able to sell effectively. They're going to want you to be able to build relationships so that the people that you're talking to want to have a relationship with you. They're going to want you to be authentic with your customers. They don't want you to pretend to care. They're going to want you to actually care about the customers and to interact with them from that authentic place of caring. They're going to want you to be able to anticipate and understand your customers, to really be inside of their heads and to be able to, to think the way that they think. They're going to want you to be able to speak understandably so that your customers get you and get what you're talking about. They're going to want you to be able to communicate customer service, to be an, kind of an ambassador of the organization, to be a representative of the organization so that as customers talk to you, they recognize you as, uh, as sort of the voice of the organization. They're going to want you to be able to negotiate because sometimes customers aren't happy. Customers are asking for something that the organization can't respond directly to or can't just give. But the organization is going to want you to be able to interact with customers in a negotiating way that communicates The organization wants you to have emotional intelligence, wants you to be able to stay on top of these moments so that your emotions don't get in your way and their emotions don't get in your way. Now finally, there's prospects. So again, prospects are those folks who fill the bill of who your team is looking to serve but who aren't yet being served by your team. So, your organization wants you to be able to forge meaningful connections with prospects. Meaning, no matter who they are, no matter um, what lack of relationship there is at the moment, the second you interact with them, they can feel it. They can feel that connection, and you are piloting that connection. And you're piloting it, you're piloting it with a particular emotional tone. You're setting the tone for a really productive conversation. They want you to be able to ask good questions so that you are collecting useful information from your prospects. And they want you to be able to listen so that you actually hear what these folks say. They want you to be enjoyable so that your prospects want to have a relationship with you and ultimately want to become your customer. And they want you to be professional. Again, a professional representative of the organization. So, you look at this screen here, and we've already got kind of a mess of, <laughs> of possibilities here when it comes to communication skills to build. Um, let me add one last list to the mix that's kind of outside of our core communication zones. 
because it's a scenario that we all enter into before we get hired in the first place. It's when we're sitting down with an interviewer. They expect something of us too. Whether they're ultimately going to be our boss or not, what the interviewer wants from us in the interview is they want us to be able to talk, talk about ourselves. They want us to be able to speak with confidence. They want us to be able to connect meaningfully with them so that they can get a sense of who we are as a human being, who we're going to be like to work with. They want us to be able to communicate with passion so that they recognize they're hiring somebody who actually cares about the job at hand. They want us to be able to ask good questions so that they, they aren't thinking of us as just somebody who does what they're asking, but we're actually somebody who is processing. We're actively processing the scenario that we're hiring for, and we're actively looking to provide the most value about the job that we're looking for. And they're asking us to be able to tell succinct points that make a point. In an interview, we need to be able to talk about ourselves, talk about our history, talk about the organizations that we've helped in the past, so that in that interview, the interviewers get a sense of the value that we've provided other, other uh, organizations in the past. So again, we're looking at, at a big mess of a list. There's just way too much here to try to wrap our brains around as it is. It's a big, messy, horrible, ugly list. We need to be able to simplify it somewhat. So let's look at what's consistent around all these scenarios, whether we're interviewing, whether we're talking to our bosses, whether we're, we're talking to our peers or our team members or customers or prospects. No matter what the scenario is, what's consistent is there's us and there's them, and by them I mean either one person or a bunch of people. Maybe it's a room full of people. And there's a definition of success. And there's something going on right now. Sometimes information is coming from them. Sometimes information needs to come from me and go to them. What we need to do is zero in on just a handful of skills that's going to be relevant to all of these scenarios. So let's start with the first one. First, most critical communication skill is appreciation or appreciating. Now, it's really important to recognize that appreciating is actually a skill that you can cultivate. Of course, it is a human thing that just naturally happens when the circumstances are right. But what we don't want to do is just, is just appreciate when the circumstances call for it. That, when we're doing that, then life is sort of leading us. We want to be able to lead ourselves. If we can consciously, intentionally choose to appreciate, then we are setting the tone in our, in our interactions, and we are projecting something positive and something intentional in our conversations and our, and our interactions. When we're not consciously appreciating, we're doing one of two things. Either our moment-by-moment -moment emotions are telling people um, how we're feeling, and very often what that tells people is there's something wrong, there's something unpleasant going on, we're upset, we're sad, we're distracted, we're frustrated. Or if no really uh, profound emotion has us at the moment, maybe we're coming across like we are indifferent, like we're aloof and distant. Choosing to appreciate in the moment does something really cool for our communications. It connects us to the people that we're talking to because we're giving the impression that we're actually appreciating them right now, which always lands well. Nobody has ever said, hey, stop appreciating me. <laughs> you know, nobody ever has a problem with, with appreciation. People really enjoy appreciation, and kind of the, the gut reaction to appreciation is they appreciate you right back. So you're setting the tone for really positive and really productive interactions. And the same is true for presentations. When you're in front of a group full of people, present, uh, excuse me, appreciate that 
present that, that crowd that you're presenting to appreciate everyone just for being there whether they're giving you the feedback that you're looking for or not so again it's really easy to appreciate when people are giving us stuff that that's that that is easy to appreciate in a presentation when somebody is smiling and nodding along it's so easy to appreciate them but don't rely on that to appreciate them when somebody is sitting there looking kind of stoic or stone-faced appreciate that maybe what that means is they are really deeply in thought maybe if their eyes are shut that means they're they're thinking about your words even more deeply maybe if they're thinking around on their phone that means they're they're tweeting your your uh the, your content you don't need to go to a negative place just because little clues are giving you uh, uh are are sort of pointing you in a, in a negative direction you can stay positive just by practicing appreciation so you are appreciating the people that you're talking to you're appreciating the content that you're talking about. You're appreciating the, the context of the conversation. You're appreciating the reason for the presentation. So maybe you are talking to your team and the scenario is negative. Maybe it's dire. Maybe there's really bad news that you need to, to, to deliver. Now, you don't want to come across like, hey, everybody, this is great. I've got bad news. So you don't want to come across happy, but you do want to come across like you care. You do want to come across like you respect the people that you're talking to, and you do want to come across like this content is important. And they are, they are getting a sense of who, you are, who, who you're being in the moment. So, you're appreciating your message. You're appreci appreciating the, the, the context and the situation. And you're getting there just by this practice of asking yourself, what can I appreciate right now? So what kind of answers pop into your head when you ask yourself these questions? Maybe you're thinking something like, you know what? This difficult situation is going to make me a better leader. This difficult news that I have to share. Yes, it's, it's difficult, but they're going to be better off knowing it than not knowing it. So always looking for the thing that you can appreciate will put you into a really productive mindset. So very often, people can be talking about stuff that maybe normally you're indifferent to, or maybe normally you have a negative response to. If you are actively listening and appreciating them, then you're looking for something meaningful and looking for something productive to get out of this interaction. Maybe you're asking yourself, what is, uh, what, what is the point here? What is, um, what is valuable about what this person is trying to tell me right now? So in conjunction with the appreciation piece, you are looking for something positive and productive and useful and meaningful to get out of this person's words. Now, um, listening isn't just receiving. It's, a, it's an interactive piece. So you're collecting this information, you are interpreting it, and you're processing it, and in that process, you are probably coming up with questions. Now, one really, really useful question to ask is um, something along the lines of, I think you're saying this, do I have that right? So it's repeating it back, maybe word for word, but not necessarily, repeating it back to the extent that you understand it, bouncing it back to them and seeing if it's landing the way that they intended for it to land. A really cool thing that you're gonna experience just from doing this simple process is you're gonna make people felt heard, you're going to make them feel understood, and you're actually going to elevate the quality of the communication so that if all they were doing was just kind of complaining about something, then they're going to hear that back. They're going to hear, oh, wow, yeah, um, yep, you got it. That I, I was just complaining, and I, and I totally get it. And have you ever had a conversation with somebody who 
really did just want to complain, but didn't want you to do anything about it, didn't want you to fix it, didn't want you to provide a solution, didn't want you to get advice from you. They just wanted to complain. If you listen and feed it back to them, that's really what they're looking for, and they will be done. It's an amazingly productive way to not to shut somebody down who is, who's being negative, but to just sort of complete the conversation. They got what they wanted from you, and they're just, and, and they're just done with it. Wow, very cool. I had a complaint about this thing. This person heard me. They fed it back to me, so, and, uh, so I have the evidence that they understand me. And now, cool, that's all I needed. I guess I'm done complaining. All right. So there's appreciating and there's listening. Third one is leading a conversation. Now, leading a conversation goes beyond just appreciating. It goes beyond just listening. It's reaching out for additional information. So whereas earlier in this listening conversation, you were receiving information and you were asking to see if you, if you got the information correctly, this is more like a data mining exploration. You're asking people about who they are. You're asking people about what they're experiencing right now. You're asking what they're pursuing. You're asking what they need right now. A really cool thing happens when you lead a conversation about the other person you just naturally build relationships that way because you're communicating that you care who they are. You are learning who they are. Very often what you're doing with your questions is you're giving them some clarity about who they themselves are. You're, you're walking them through a process that gets them to, to understand this, the, the story that they're in right now, the scenario that they're experiencing right now. If you're truly asking these productive questions and combining it with listening and appreciation, what you're doing is you are being kind of a guide for them to help them understand the, the world as they're experiencing it right now and what their place in the world is right now. And they're thinking of you as kind of this, um, this, this caring guide who wants to make a difference for them in some way. All right. Now, the fourth one is storytelling. So there will always be opportunities to tell stories. Leading a conversation about them is hugely valuable. It very often creates opportunities for you to talk about something that you care about, to talk about yourself, or to talk about somebody that, that you care about. Storytelling is a, it's both a, uh, a process of organizing your information so that it's concise and meaningful, but it's also delivering that information in a really engaging way, in a way that engages your heart and your emotions and your, your interest so that it inspires them to listen. Storytelling is really powerful because story wired to make meaning. So if you're organizing your information into a story, they get what you're telling them. They, they understand it. And just as important, they can tell the story over to someone else without losing any of the, the core meaning. They are replicating the information that you have put into their brains. Now, the fifth and final crucial communication skill is helping. Now, this can be a tough thing to wrap your brain around. It's like, well, what do you mean this is a skill? I want you to think about helping like it's a mindset. It's a way to think about your interactions and your presentations. A lot of people go into communication feeling like the job is just to inform, just to communicate data. In my humble opinion, that is a huge lost opportunity. You want to go into your conversations and your presentations looking to help the people you're talking to, whether it's a single person or a room full of people. Whenever possible, 
if you are going into this thing with time to prepare, then you're thinking about, okay, who are these folks? What are their challenges? Um, what are their goals? What can I do in this interaction to make a positive difference for them? So you're kind of strategizing in advance. When you don't have that opportunity, it's okay. You can actually figure it out in the moment. But you have this mindset. You have this mindset of wanting to interact with these folks to help them. And then, if it's a conversation, what you're doing is you're asking, who are you right now? What are your challenges? What are your goals? And what can I do to make a difference for you? If you're doing that to a room full of people, you can actually still do it too. You can ask the room what's going on for you right now. What brought you here to this event? And what do you want to walk away with? And what can I do with you right now to, to give you what you're looking for? So it doesn't matter if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a group presentation. If you walk into these um, scenarios with a mindset of helping, it's going to make a profound difference on what you're saying how you're saying it, and how you're landing to your audience. So let's map these back, at least conceptually. We can't go through the thousand scenarios that we talked about, but I want you to recognize here there is interacting and presenting to interviewers, interacting and presenting to uh, up the ladder to your boss and your boss's bosses and your boss's peers. There's interacting and presenting to, to your peers, to the team members that report to you, to your customers, to your prospects. All of the challenges that I laid out earlier, they all become a mix and match uh, combination of these five things that I've laid out here. There's appreciating, there's listening, there's leading a conversation, there's storytelling, and there's helping. You take those five things, you mix and match them, and you're able to produce any of the results in any of the contexts that we laid out earlier. Now, I could just conclude there, but it's really important to me that you recognize that these skills aren't just to make them happy at your place of work, not just to make the, the employers happy and give them what they want. Of course, that's going to be useful to you. But it's important to recognize what you want in your workspace as well. Now, according to a 2014 Career Builder survey, here's what you want at work. You want to be recognized and rewarded for your value. You want job and career security. You want meaning and significance in your work. And you want to be challenged. You want these four things at work. If these four things are in place, then you're doing pretty well. You're happy at work, which makes you in about the top 10% of, of workers these days. So many people are unhappy because at least one of these things are not present at work. You can actually create a happier workspace for you by employing these critical communication skills. Now, there's a core thing that I want you to walk away from this presentation with. You can make yourself indispensable at work by doing four really critical things, which are going to be a mix and match combination of the five critical things that, that I laid out earlier. You make yourself indispensable, all of a sudden you've got job security, you've got meaning, you've got, you've got uh, reward and recognition, and you're just happier at work. So the first thing that I want to suggest that you do is start networking inside your organization. What that means is interact with folks in the team, not your team, just, or well, certainly in your team, but not just in your team, anywhere in the organization. Start to network with them and bring appreciation into the mix. Really enjoy the people that you're talking to. Ask them questions and listen to them. Um, get their story. Find out where they are in the organization. Find out what they do. Find out what, 
problems they are there to solve. Find out what solutions they deliver. Find out what outcomes they're responsible for. Also, find out what their challenges are. Find out what their goals are. Find out who could make a difference to them, just sort of abstractly. You start to do this, and a couple really cool things start to happen. You start to learn how the organization works. You start to learn how people interrelate in the organization. You've suddenly wrapped your brain around kind of the map of the organization, and you become kind of a go-to person for other people in the organization because you know a lot about how the organization works right now. You also know who offers what to whom so that when somebody has a problem, they say, hey, um, I'm looking for, for uh, a problem, uh, a solution to this kind of problem. Who should I talk to? You're able to, to connect them and that, that has you stand out as just a shining star of value to anybody inside the organization. Now, can you hear how this is just a tremendous thing for you to do that, that has you um, become recognized as this indispensable team member? Because you know the inner workings and you are recognized as like a relationship hub. Okay. All right, so you're networking inside your organization. Second thing that you can do to become indispensable is to network outside your organization. So I mean this in a couple of ways. So You've got um, a community inside your organization. You sort of have a community in, in an immediate circle right outside of, of the organization. You've got, uh, you've got kind of um, ancillary folks who serve the organization externally uh, one way or another. You've also got target markets outside of the organization. And you've also got people who maybe don't seem to be related to the organization one way or another at all. You want to start networking in any of those circles. Build relationships with those folks. What that means is engage people in conversation kind of wherever you go. You might want to start at uh, venues where the people in your industry hang out, especially if you care about your industry, and I sure hope you do because if you want to be indispensable to your organization, you really do need to care. Anyway, get out of your organization, but go to places where people are and start engaging them. Engage them with appreciation, ask them questions, listen to what they have to say, learn about who they are, what they do, who they help, and start to position yourself as somebody who could potentially help them. Listen to what they say. Be a source of potential value to them. And, oh my gosh, it's going to be amazing. You're going to build relationships with anybody, anywhere. And those relationships add to your value to the organization. Not just because you are um, connecting yourself with clients or customers, which you definitely should do, but also because you are connecting yourself to uh, prospects, and you are building the reputation of the organization just by being a good person, a, a source of value in all of your conversations with anybody anywhere. All right, the third thing that you can do to make you yourself ind indispensable to your organization is listen for opportunity. So once you've wrapped your brain around what your organization does, you can start to listen for opportunity for the organization. Really critical thing to get is every organization exists to help somebody. The only reason it exists is to make that difference for somebody. You're listening for people being those somebodies, and you're listening for people to have those problems that your organization exists to solve. If you start listening for opportunity, what that means is you're engaging people in conversation, you're listening for who they are, you're listening for the challenges that they're facing right now, and you're kind of mapping them back to what you know about your organization or to a subset of your organization, and you're going, why, you know, I I think I see something here. You have this problem, and I know somebody in my organization who could make a difference for you, who could supply the help that you're 
looking for, or maybe the, the help that you didn't realize would make a difference for you. You're listening for opportunity and you're acting on it. You are making connections. You're saying, hey, um, can I connect you to somebody in my organization? Because at the very least, a productive conversation could be had here. So anywhere you go with anybody, you can listen for opportunity and that can serve your organization, which ultimately will serve you inside of the organization. The fourth and final thing that you can do to become indispensable to your organization is to tell your company's story. And I'm going to expand on this just a little bit. Tell your company's story, but also tell your own story. So the, easily the most uh, direct thing you can do for your organization is to know what the story is. And the story isn't, isn't about what's going on for your company right now. The story is about who your company helps. It's the problems your organization exists to, to solve, and it's the solutions that they deliver. It's the outcomes that your organization exists to create for, for its clientele. You want to start being able to talk about your organization in those terms so that wherever you go, you know, maybe it's just a party and somebody says, what do you do? You can really quickly and concisely communicate what your organization is all about. And if you do that with appreciation, what that comes across as is authentic excitement for what my, what my organization does in the world. You come across like a really great supporter of the organization, and you're growing in little ways, you're growing the reputation of your organization. Plus, you might plant a seed for um, another part of the conversation where somebody's saying, oh, wait, um, your company does that? You know, I could, I could use that. Or I know somebody who could use that. You might actually be creating little business leads just by really uh, proudly and excitedly and passionately and with appreciation telling your organization's story. All right, so in review, there are five really critical communication skills that taking, taken in combination work complementarily to give you the ability to respond powerfully and effectively in any challenging communication, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a group presentation. And that list is appreciating, appreciating the people that you're talking to and appreciating the content, appreciating what you're talking about. It's listening to the people that you're talking to, whether it's a single person or a room full of people. It is leading conversations so that you are learning about them and you are making the most of the interaction. You are, you are owning the productivity of the conversation. It's storytelling so that you are organizing information in a way that they get so that they understand what you're talking about and they know what to do with what you're talking about. And it's helping. It's engaging other people in a way that makes you um, be the person who can make a difference for them. It's setting yourself up in their minds as somebody that they can go to, to to make the difference that they're looking for, or at least go to if they don't know what they need, but they just need somebody who wants to help one way or another. So walk away with these five things, and um, I think we are ready for questions. All right, so we have a couple of questions. Um, firstly, what books or resources do you suggest to expand on this? Great question. Um, let me be completely self-centered for just a second. Um, my business partner, Dean Hires, wrote a book called uh, Winning, uh, Winning Presence for Business Pre Presenters. And it really captures how to do this in a variety of uh, of scenarios. So that's an, it's an excellent resource. Um, the, the classic is the Dale Carnegie, how to win friends, uh, what is it, how to win friends and influence people. That is a, that's a really great resource as well. It's going on like 60 years old, something like that, but it's still just as relevant today. Wonderful. Another question. 
question that we have is, how would somebody develop these skills for someone who kind of is lacking in the natural tendency? Oh, how would somebody develop these skills as somebody who's sort of naturally lacking? Okay, so what that, what that sounds to me like is somebody who on a regular basis doesn't interact with, with folks. So um, this might sound a little bit crazy. I'm wired for introversion. I'm wired to be one of those people who doesn't communicate terribly well. Um, most of my um, first 30 years was me interacting with a computer because it was nice and simple and straightforward. Really, all I was doing was just getting into the habit of not communicating with people on a regular basis. So what can people do to cultivate these skills? They can get out there. They can sort of force themselves to interact more with other human beings on a face -to -face, in a face-to-face -face way. Um, maybe that'll be uncomfortable. Well, very likely it'll be uncomfortable to begin with. But doing anything that you aren't in the practice of doing is uncomfortable to begin with. You know, swimming for the first time is going to be uncomfortable. Riding a bike for the first time is going to be uncomfortable, or the first 50 times. So just getting out there and interacting with folks, just getting out there and presenting to folks is a great way to get good and get better at this stuff. Of course, another critical thing you can do is take classes, take workshops, and we're going to be talking about a few of the, of the workshops that the U offers that, that can um, download a tremendous amount of a really valuable information about how to cultivate these skills. Wonderful. Thank you. Another question that we have is, how would you suggest implementing this communication approach within a larger organization? Oh, um, uh, how to, uh, how to, uh, actually give me that one more time. How would you suggest implementing this uh -huh. communication approach within a larger organization? Gotcha. Well, um, I actually talked about that a fair, uh, a fair amount in uh, the first um, way to make yourself indispensable. What I, rec uh, what I recommend is every day, every day, try to talk to somebody that you don't know, somebody that you don't already have a relationship with. Maybe you can ask them out to lunch. Um, you know, go to the cafeteria and just appreciate them for whoever they are and kind of interview them. Ask about what they do. Ask about what they love about what they do. Ask about... Um, what's difficult about their job, ask about their challenges, ask about their goals, ask about who they help, ask about where they fit in the organization, ask about their challenges and what, what keeps them going and what they're, what they're uh, working towards. Really, if you just ask questions and really listen and process what they tell you and let that processing inspire another question, really cool stuff happens. People like you because you care about them and they want to have a relationship with you. Ultimately, they're going to start asking about you. You're, you're going to be, be uh, giving them information in, re in response. You're building a really high quality professional relationship just so that you can, uh, well, you know, just kind of for no reason, but also to elevate yourself inside the organization and in your career. You're, you're making yourself more better known inside of uh, the organization by reaching out to anybody and everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, another question is, how can I get better at thinking on my feet by using stories to illustrate a point? Oh, great. Okay. So really quickly, stories are um, problems where problematic, well, let, let me start here. Stories are about a main character who are in a problematic situation, then stuff occurs to impact that situation and bring about a happier ending situation. So what you can do to think on your feet is not try to think about the whole story all at once. Um, we work a lot with folks to help them build their storytelling skills. And right off the bat, the, uh, initially, the difficulty is People might sense a complete story, but they don't know where to start. And then they just 
it just becomes sort of a mishmash. They're, they're kind of talking about the main character and the problematic situation and what needs to happen and the happier ending. And very often they're just kind of going from place to place and people get lost. Your audience gets lost. So the way to uh, think on your feet when you're telling a story is to just stay in one of those zones at a time until you feel like you've covered it really thoroughly. So make sure you're really clear on who you're talking about. Who is this main character that you're telling a story about? What is the problematic situation here? What takes place? What needs to happen to impact the situation? And what's the better situation over here? If you just stay in each of these zones kind of um, exclusively without wandering into the other, other ones, then you are in the moment just thinking about that one piece and you're not distracted uh, by thinking about all the other pieces. And when you're done with that piece, you can just move on to the next one. One last little nuance. I just laid it out in a particular order. You don't have to, to speak in that order. So maybe you're inspired to, to tell a story and your brain goes to one particular place in the story. Go ahead and be in that place, but stay in that place until you're done talking about it. Then go someplace else. Stories don't need to be linear. Quentin Tarantino proved that with Pulp Fiction. Uh, but they do need to be complete. There does need to be a clear main character. There needs to be a clear problem situation. There needs to be a clear action sequence. And there needs to be a clear outcome situation. Another question is, how could I repair situations in which my superior has possibly misunderstood my action? Ooh, ooh. How do I clear up difficult situations where my superior has misunderstood my, my intentions? OK. The really good news about difficult situations, as I think about it, is it's, it lends itself to story structure just beautifully. So a lot of people feel like um, telling a story is very often telling people what happened. Um, it can be that, but if that's all you do, then you can leave your audience in kind of a negative place. So, um, you know, I was, I was talking to my, to my teammates and everything was going great. Uh, and then I said this thing and I think they got offended and I, I didn't mean to offend them, but they walked away before I could apologize and, and now I don't know what to do. There's, that, that has story structure, but it, it, doesn't lend, it doesn't end in this positive place that you need it to end in. Remember I said a little while ago that, that every story is about a main, main character that starts out with a problematic situation and then stuff happens and creates a better outcome. What I just told was, uh, was a story that ended in a negative place. What I want you to recognize is that negative place can become the beginning of the real story that you're telling. So you sit down with your boss and you say, listen, um, I know that I created a, a problem, but I, but I want you to, to recognize it wasn't my intention. What my intention is, is to create this positive thing. To be honest, I don't know what I need to do. Um, will you help me figure out what I need to do? So go ahead and communicate the negative thing, but don't let that be the ending. Let that be the, the beginning, the not so happy beginning. Communicate what you truly do intend which has got to be something better than this, right? Communicate this situation that's going to be out, out there in, in the future and collaborate with your boss to, to figure out what you can do or what you could do to create this better situation. Perfect. And just one last question. Um, do you have any suggestions for questions to ask people to help drive a leading conversation that may be outside of the ordinary? Ooh, that, boy, I, I would need some detail on what outside of the ordinary means. Um, Something that would stray away from regular conversation, oh, like who oh, are okay. you, what do you do? Got it, great. Okay, so um, my business partner is particularly phenomenal at leading really productive conversations with folks that, um, that doesn't, uh, with conversations that don't, lend themselves obviously to the professional scenario, if that makes sense. He loves networking, 
but actually he doesn't particularly like networking in networking scenarios. He's particularly great at leading really productive conversations with strangers on an airplane um, or um, somebody who just sits next to him uh, in a bar. He's amazingly good at engaging these folks in a really deep and meaningful conversation that's about them and about their life. He says it's, the, you know, he, he says he doesn't quite understand it because people are sort of bearing their soul to him in a matter of minutes. And it just naturally happens for him. What I say he j just naturally does is he appreciates these folks for who they are and he listens to them, and he asks questions about them. So um, going back to the story structure, if you ask questions just to wrap your brain around who this person is that you're talking to, and you, you ask questions about what's going on for them right now that's less than ideal, really often they're going to go to a not necessarily professional place. Um, and if you, if you go into it with a with a completely non-judgmental, open, appreciative um, vibe, they're going to they're gonna open their heart to you, and they're going to talk about whatever's on their mind that is less than ideal. Um, once you've covered that topic thoroughly, you can flip the subject and ask about the future. So if this is your challenging situation, what are you aiming for? What do you want? And they... Um, they will, at the very least, really appreciate the question because that will get them out of this negative space and get them thinking about possibility. And then you can think about, well, what can I do as a person who wants to help? What can I do to make a difference? And very often it's just leading the conversation that will, that will uh, make for a really productive conversation. No matter who you are, no matter who they are, no matter what the circumstances are, even if they're really odd or unusual. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.